Yeah, my name is Robin Travis, um, author of Prison to the Streets. Mama Can't Raise No Man. Um, I nearly forgot Freedom from the Streets. And a feature in Safe, a Safe Anthology by Derek Ousu. So um, I'm currently writing a whole bunch of different stuff. So a general writer. Um, today I'm here to introduce a podcast which I'll be doing for the next 10 weeks or so. And it's um, in line with what's happening in National Prison Radio, which is, um, the book is being re-aired for the second time. Give thanks to the Most High for that opportunity. And as a result of that, I've decided to do a podcast. Um, so long story short, Prison to the Street podcast is gonna be like none other. We're gonna be encouraging you guys to read alongside the podcast, basically. So every week we're gonna do four chapters for the book um, and I'm going to be asking you people to pick up your books if you already have it and um, we have a reprint of Prison to the Street coming out also so if you don't have a copy I would love for you guys to buy a copy of the book and basically participate with us on this book club slash um, podcast slash I'll be explaining snippets of the workshop and inviting people down from characters from the book yeah, today's the introduction and my first guest I would love to introduce to you because to be fair, without this individual here, you guys would have never read Prisoner to the Streets. So without further ado, I would like to introduce none other than the mental farmer himself, Natty Lynn, a.k.a. Lyndon Waters, a.k.a. many other things. So <laughs> the mental farmer, thank you for coming down and really appreciate the time. More than welcome, Robin. You really know I'm always handy for you and everybody else that I meet. Mm. It's part of um, what uh, floats my boat. Mm -hmm. and um, lifts my planes. <laughs> okay, so uh, you are an inspiration to me. Likewise, bless you. Uh, together with all the others who have shown me so much respect um, long before you even got to really know me. Mm -hmm. That for me is invaluable, it's priceless. Um, lots of people see that. Um, lots of people whom are so-called uh, celebrities, mm. um, A-listers, you know, they're never happy. I, in fact, I have a couple, you know, who I'm coaching. Yeah. And they've told me they've never been happy. I've got all the money in the world, mm. <laughs> but they've never been happy. And so, therefore, it always strikes me as to uh, not just the definition of happiness, mm -hmm. but also what it means to someone. Yeah. And without happiness, where might we all be? So I decided to write my own philosophies. Mm -hmm. And I say, happiness is a state of mind. What do you think about that? Without getting into it too much, because you know me and you could talk <laughs> on any subject and all day. And if I answer that question, we might end up a whole okay. hour talking about That's fair perception. enough. However, I'm uh -huh. going to answer the question as to say, I don't believe happiness is a choice because there's a lot of people suffering with traumas and depression and I'm, I'm, I don't like this whole idea that happiness is a choice. I think to want to be happy is a choice and to try to strive towards it, but not everyone's mental state is at a position of where they can say I'm happy. So at the moment, I love people talking positive messages and energy to keep them positive, but I don't always believe in the quotes. However, this is why I don't like talking to you sometimes. Because you go, you expand the mind. However, I hear what you're saying. So, mm. to stay focused on and why I brought you into the show, because Lyndon, to me, is like what they, they use these labels, like thought leader. So, to me, you're a thought leader. Wow. Um, and not just a thought leader, you're a mental farmer. And if people understand what that means, a farmer is somebody who sold seeds and they, um, they, they reap the, what they've cropped, basically. Um, the harvest, yeah. The harvest, yeah. Um, so for me, you've sown a lot of seeds that have got me to where I am as a, as a writer. Um, and I think why I'm inviting you on the show today, I think it's really important for people to know, for people to know why basically um, we are, why we wrote the book. Um, because you mentioned something about celebrities and happiness. My happiness is very important to me and I feel like I sacrificed my happiness in order to tell the story. 
if that makes sense. So when I say sacrifice my happiness, nobody wants to live in the past. Nobody wants to revisit their traumas. And I just feel that a lot of people may have thought I wrote a, wrote a book to kind of glamorize or celebritize my myself, if, if that makes any sense. Um, and you are the man who's got a lot of explanation for why I wrote the book. So without the long, the long talking and going around in circles, can you tell people how we met? That's the first question, and then I'm gonna ask the follow-up question, which is, what made you write the book? What made you ask me to write the book, or suggest, sorry? So the first question is, would you like to tell people how we met? Yeah, um, it's quite easy to, to say that. Um, I, I also was uh, not just a coach to people, but I was also a sports coach. Mm. And uh, through football, because yeah. I did coach four different sports, mm -hmm. but through football, I had one of my ex-footballers, Nathan, yeah. who phoned me up and he was me. pretty excited and he said, ah, oh, Lynn, Lynn, do you want a striker? Mm. I said, man, I've got three. He says, yeah, but you've not seen anybody like this guy. Mm. This guy is just a, the kind of striker I know you would love. Now, Nathan's been with me since he was nine. Yeah, Nathan's a baller. Just right? say that. I and, can't and, miss and Murat, that. yeah? yeah. Right. So, therefore, yeah. when he got excited, uh, it was you and two um, other guys who were uh, midfielders. Okay. But when I started talking about you, I got pretty excited myself. And I said, but send him down. But did you warn him? about the, the amount of discipline that it will take to play for me. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, we, we, we think he will, you know, you know, you love him, Lynn, you love him, but just think about his skills. Yeah. And that's how we really met. They also told you about me. Not as much as I, as I needed to know, but yeah. No, but <laughs> you did, did the thing, you know, I got in touch with you, right, yeah. by telephone, and um, I said to you, well, the best way for you to learn anything about me is to come and watch the boys play. And I uh, told you about where we need to meet and stuff like And you actually turned up much, much earlier than <laughs> even my normal squad would turn up. And then we sat in the car. That gave us an opportunity to sit in the car and just just talk. Mm, I remember that. And Same that was you. really how we met. Mm -hmm. And then what happened after that? There was there was a, a football match. I think we had. Well, we were going to a football match. So oh, the same day. Yeah. 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 So um, although I would have loved to have travelled with you, I I did drive. You know, yeah. at the time. So we, we just followed each other. Okay. And we went over to somewhere in East End mm -hmm. to play the game. And um, <laughs> when we were in the, <laughs> the dressing room. Um, I, you said to me, am I playing? And I said, no. <laughs> you gave me a look that if it could hurt, I would have been wounded forever. Mm. That look was really like, you know, what do you mean I'm not playing kind of thing? You didn't actually voice it, but... <laughs> so what are you saying? I didn't play that game? No. Cool. No, so no. Then, all right, cool. I this couldn't is... break my rules. Cool. So then this fast forwards me to the second match then, because this is why I remember... Um, myself being around uh, around you and how our relationship kind of bonded. I remember there was a match, I think Marseille. My oh, Marseille. Super yeah. player, big up Marseille, mm. excellent footballer. He's got his own club Ex now as well. Yeah, forward, excellent yeah. footballer. Mm. And big up Nathan, big up everyone. Um, these Tottenham footballers are amazing growing up with. But um, I just want to say, I think Marseille called me to come, no, Nathan called me to come down for the second match. And I know you hadn't played me. I think I brought down Winston from Hackney, another footballer. Oh, yeah, he's a great got player. Winston. Mm. I think he's going to be you. on one of the up-and-coming shows anyway. But um, I brought Winston down, and there was a match that you guys was losing. Would you like to just say that story before we get straight into the... Oh, sure, the sure. Mix, it so. was towards the end of the season. Yeah. And um, I asked you... Well, first of all, we played another game in between. I, I did ask you to come training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you did turn up, so I was very happy mm. because I just wanted you to know this is a system that's been used for years mm -hmm. and I couldn't, no matter what I thought about you, you could have been married on a Pele rolled in one with Messi and the rest and, and Cristiano, I could not play you 
just like that because I would have been betraying, you know, the trust of the the squad. Yeah. But because you turned up, I was able to give you part of a game. Mm, yeah, I remember. And uh, that was really, really nice. I watched you, I watched your movement, played with Marcy, of course, made it easier. Yeah, Marseille's amazing. And I thought, wow, you know, I love this speed. Mm. Um, because we didn't have much speed up front before with the other forward. And I thought, right, I love the way you move, you find your space. You were a typical striker, you were always shooting. You know, mm. even if you didn't hit the target, you were shooting. And that is a threat to the opposition. Mm -hmm. So immediately I loved you. Your skills, everything. So that was it. The, the one you were asking me about was, was the end of the season match um, at St. Aloysius's. That was yeah? my second game for you. Yeah. And um, I made you a substitute. Yeah. Because <laughs> I wanted to get the best out of you. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that. I think this is where we our relationship really, really. It, this if it's funny because if I had a different reaction to this part of the story you're about to say, we would have never got the book because I was actually thinking this guy's taking liberties. Yeah. And I don't like the way he's dealing with me. Yeah. And it was ego talking. Mm -hmm. It was like, hold on a minute. Does do, like the streets? Do you know who I am? Mm -hmm. Like you've called me to come and play football. Bro, I don't sit on the bench. I don't do this. I've never sat on the bench. We mm -hmm. score goals. That's what we like. Do you want to win this game? Mm -hmm. And it was a cockiness. But I suppose it was because of frustration because I, I was asked to join the team mm -hmm. by Nathan. Mm -hmm. So even though Nathan's asking you to take me, he's asked me to join the team. So I remember, but I'll let you carry on the story. And this is, for me, where I think we started to go close and it could have gone the other way. But these, these are the reasons what just... To relate to the book is the reason why we came to this. I understood myself better. It was it's great that you said that yeah. because um, I wanted you to know that through our brief conversations that I realised you had no discipline. Mm. And there's no way I would have been able to help you unless you understand that you have to be disciplined when dealing with me. Mm. As very, I'm a very laid back man as you know mm. but discipline is my last name discipline is my first name and discipline is my middle name and so therefore I had to literally teach you a lesson yeah I would disagree no I wouldn't disagree I would say I had <laughs> I had enough discipline I got enough licks as a youth my discipline was, game was on point big up my mum for the discipline she instilled in me allowed me to instill in my children discipline was always there um what wasn't, what was lacking was, was the discipline to, to is respect is actually. So the discipline falls in line with Right, the, so yeah. it is called discipline. But as a whole, I'm whatever. saying, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you know what discipline you had and what discipline well, I, I you to. actually mm. showed to whomever. But for me, I had to tell you what the rules are. And the rules are, if you don't have discipline, I don't care if you could stand on your head mm. and score a goal, you are not playing for powerhouse Real Brazil FC. Mm. End of story. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have to argue with you about mm. it because ego gets blamed for a lot of things. Yeah. Get blamed for moves. Get blamed. But ego is really the, the thing within us. It's an entity that keeps us as survivors. So it defends the I, the letter I, which is the, the supreme being within. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it does. So it gets bad name. Mm. But I, I, I wasn't going to put up, listen, I've been doing this thing for years, okay? I was in the Jamaica, uh, all Jamaica squad. Yeah. Yes, and went away because a pedophile took over his coach. You understand? So there is no way that any player is going to outdo me when it comes to wanting to play without discipline. And that's what it was all about. Cool. Can we talk about that game then? So I can, yeah, can we... yeah, well, of course, you know, part of the discipline was uh, if you're a substitute, you have to warm up every 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I did make it clear in the dressing room especially everybody else knew but I wanted to say it again so you did hear if when I look around you're not <laughs> moving not exercising not doing something you will stand there and watch the game the whole day or go home didn't matter to me because I, I couldn't find a, a forward like you because of your uniqueness 
I can find forwards and I can find every player because people leave other clubs to come to play for powerhouse sweepers. Mm. So, so I had nothing to lose. Cool, can you tell me about the game then? The, the game was... No, not the game, the bit like there was something in that test because you're talking about discipline just for the viewers. Yeah. And they might not understand the context of the discipline is... You're, and it's funny because it's a street attitude. It's like almost I'm saying, does this mm-hmm. man know who I am? Mm-hmm. Like, bro, I don't waste my time to do this when you're standing in the cold. Mm-hmm. You got me running up and down in shorts. I'm from the streets, basically, bro. I didn't come. You're lucky you got me in shorts. Mm-hmm. I don't care about football as much as these people care about football. Mm-hmm. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. So you made me humble myself, and I want the viewers to kind of understand that story of me being on the bench and how I came on. And, yeah, you well, you know, it's, it's, it was quite exciting, actually, because when I have a new player, um, I want you to do your best out there. Mm. Just your best. Mm. That's all I ask. Mm. Yeah? And for me, you hadn't played enough with the team to fully understand what, how you could get your best. I have different tactics. Yeah, and it worked. And what you didn't know when you say, I wonder if this man knows I'm from the street, I, I, you didn't know that part of what I do is outreach work. Mm. And I could talk to anyone. And what I wasn't doing with you is judging you mm. because I don't do that. I realize that that's the, the number one thing that I have to do when I'm speaking to people, especially I call you roadies. Okay, roadies. Roadies is living in a different world out there. They're taking risk. So those are all very good characteristic traits. Being able to survive, challenging. You see, I, I understand roadies because, you know, the local councils have stopped giving extracurricular activities in every area. So you and the others found it quite exciting to be challenged out there. My thing was to make you really want to go on the pitch and do your level best, because we had to win. We were already one nil down. That's why I was vexed. Yeah? Yeah. And I look round and he said, are you ready for me, Lynn? I said, no, not ready. (laughs) Yeah? And then I I ignored you. We were two nil down. And I'm getting, I look I'm around, mad as you're talking about And I yeah. said to you, yeah. um, do you feel warm enough? And you said, yes. I said, well, what about your knee? You're wearing a... Knee brace. A knee brace. Yeah. And uh, have you got an injury? And you said, well, you know, it's all right. I can, I can move. And I said, well, listen, you will get a game. And I, I deliberately said to you, even if it's the last five minutes, <laughs> I could see the screw on your face. I've, I've never, because of that ego again, I've never been put on the bench in my life. I, I found it so offensive, but I think it, it made me humble myself. And then um, you brought me up. Yeah, yeah so. but that was it really. And then, of course, we, with 20 minutes to go, mm. I took off the striker who had scored 50 goals the the season before, mm-hmm. yeah, and Duane, yeah? Yeah, super striker. Super striker. When he's striker. ready, when he's ready, yeah, super Yeah, but striker. a different striker. Mm. He's a number nine. Yeah. You're really a 10. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? Because you're creating as well. But as Marcel was already in the 10 space, yeah. you were going to be my man up front. And with that pace. So I brought you on. I said, ready, probably I'm ready. I took off Dwayne, Dwayne went completely bananas because I've never taken him off before. Mm. And I put you on and you went on and within four or five minutes, you'd scored a goal. Mm. So we're now 2-1. Sick goal, I remember that goal. Yeah? And then you scored a second goal and that was 2-2. Yeah. And And then they they got another goal. So now it's 3-2. So we needed two more goals. That Marseille scored. And Marseille yes. scored a brilliant goal. Brilliant goal. So with 3-3, three, three, and we just have something like six minutes to go, and here you pop up again. Bang. One game was top of the league. Mm. Felt good for you. Felt good for the team. I just wanted and to rest. explain to the viewers something, because in later chapters, what you've said, something was very poignant. Like my temper. I remember being so angry previously so you have me on the bench that when I've come on the pitch I've channeled that anger into, into a performance 
That's right. And that was your technique. I've been out so there a long time, Robin. Salute to that. I've this is why I say time. London is the mental <laughs> farmer because there was there was a method in the madness, um, yep. and it works. But again, this is now bringing it to the book. <clears throat> so up to that time, I wasn't looking for a friend. Um, I was like Drake, no new friends. I don't really like new people. I wasn't looking for a counselor. I wasn't looking for a father figure. I wasn't looking for none of the above. I was looking for someone who I could reason with on a level. I wasn't even looking for it, but I realized I could reason with you and get conversation that made sense. So for me, it was like, um, how can I say this? It was good talking to you. Um, there was a period of time where we was talking um, and you started to ask me about my life and ask me questions I started to share with you. And I felt open to share with you. And then we, um, I don't even know. I think I shared with you that Neville told me to write a book. Mm -hmm. Pastor Kevin told me to write a book. And your mum, when you were nine, told you to write things down. Always told me to write, um, mm -hmm. um, who else? Adrian and Shalene. So mm -hmm. these people told me to write a book and I shared with you that they wanted me to write a book. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't want to write this book. Um, but. Yeah, just to get straight to it, there was there was traction from yourself. I'm saying to people today, letting it be known that if it wasn't for you and this, and your what's the word, we wouldn't have written that book. So I would like you to explain methodology. To methodology. I'd like <laughs> to, to explain to people what what brought you to this realization that I needed to write a book. Well, you know, as you say, we had many conversations. We had meetings in your car very often. Yeah, and um, I, I started to get your story. I started to understand, you know, what you've been through. Mm. You know, um, being in homes and stuff like that. And I thought, wow, you know, this is terrible. I wonder what caused it. But then you were telling me everything you know you just opened up in the end you just opened up and I, I said wow this this man has a heart he's a heart man like me mm. yeah you don't deserve having that kind of um, lifestyle but I didn't tell you that but in my mind I was thinking that mm. and I'm saying I just want to be the best person available so that at any time, even if you were angry, you could phone me up and go, Lynn, I'm angry, you know? And I would either listen or I would say something. And so I, I decided to let you know that you are not alone and you're not the first one who's been out on the street. Mm. And I told you about my life in Jamaica, mm. that we had 52 of us, and it just so happened to be five streets gathered in one corner. Yeah, which could be a frightening prospect for people. Mm -hmm. But what happened was that I knew that as leader, right, of that group, everybody listened to me, everybody did exactly what I told them. Out of respect, not fair. But for your road style, it was all about fear. Facts. Yeah? And so I brought that to you and said, you know, it's fair. And it's about mindsets. That's from way back then. And we discussed at a level different things, mostly your actual lifestyle. And you said to me, you know, I'd like to take you down to where I live, you know? Because you used to ride a bike, didn't you? Super right, mm -hmm. and, and I remember you were telling me, in fact, you phoned me and told me somebody stole your bike and what you're going to do to them. I remember that, yeah. And I said to you, Robin, <sighs> I'll get you, mm. you know, and you actually did go out there and you found the people with your bike. Mm. I found the bike, not the people. Oh, you found the bike? The people, yeah, that would have been. Anyway, you found the bike mm. and then you, you, what I liked about it is that you phoned me back and you said, I've got my bike. And I said, wow, you know, this man has determination. So in everything that he told me, I was assessing 
And I was saying to myself, wow, but this, this man's a, a wonderful man. You know, wonder what capabilities he's, he's not aware of. Mm. That was really my thing. So every question I asked you was for you to think about about your capabilities. Mm -hmm. That was a proper, proper coaching, right? It's to not me saying what you need to do, mm -hmm. but by questioning you, digging up your psyche mm -hmm. as the mental farmer, as the, 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 the food farmer churns up the ground, planting a seed of change in your psyche mm. and asking you to nurture it. And here we are. So I, I think there was a time where I was in uni studying youth justice criminology parallel to this. Mm. Um, and I just want to give the views an understanding of how much I didn't resistance shown to not wanting to write the book. Because like I said to you, all those people told me to write a book. No, 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 no. Leave me alone. You're talking nonsense. Why the hell would I want to talk about my past, eh? I remember you saying that to me. I'm glad that you did. <laughs> you, you, don't do wanna, you don't want to put yeah. your dirty linen in public. Mm -hmm. That's the way you actually phrased okay. it. Yeah. And then I remember saying, I remember the feeling of, I can't push to write this book because, no disrespect, but I'm going to say it anyway, you can edit it. All these, I'm not saying names, all these films made by British people in terms of the streets, nonsense, not accurate. I'm going to uni, I'm hearing lecturers tell me about I'm a gang member, nonsense, not accurate. And it did something to my inner being. And to hear a man keep telling me how good I am and how great I am, it's like, give me a break. Like, you're trying to big me up, telling me that I'm something else, and I'm hearing from the world that I'm this gang member. <laughs> Even though I've left this, imagine even in my in my own ends, I was driving different cars when I was in uni because I had a car crash, um, and I all these courtesy cars were given to me. And while I was at uni, and I'm on my motorbike, one minute driving, police are still harassing me. There were mm. rumors that Robin hasn't changed; he's still on the road. Yeah, yeah some I remember thinking this is from my own community. I'm with Big Up Wally, who's doing the filming now. I was with Wally, and we get stopped by police for fun. I'm in uni. We're getting arrested. He's got sickle cell. I think I told you at the time, mm -hmm. we're getting arrested, stopped mm -hmm. and harassed for obstruction to sell drugs. So in my mind, Tupac says a lyric, um, maybe if I change something, something, but I'm a fog till I die. Who am I trying to kid? I'm a fog till I die. I can't remember the lyric worth work. Mm -hmm. He's saying, even if I change, mm -mm, I'm a fog till I die. And I'm like, wow, I've got to accept that this is who I am, a fog forever, mm -hmm. because this is the picture that I feel like is being portrayed by me, by the rest of the world. So hearing you say, I remember you called me a genius one time, I was like, this guy's a madman. Yeah, I remember um, that, yeah. The certain <laughs> things you were saying, it wasn't the norm to hear. Um, and you were looking at, I told you I had a temper problem, I kept, even football, I could score a goal and still want to beat up somebody. Yeah. So when I was at Power League in Tottenham, before joining the team, I was ready to fight you. Top it. All these guys at Power League, Marlon, me and Marlon always love Marlon to this. Me and Marlon, Marlon always, I've got a temper, and that's what I kind of wanted your help with. Mm -hmm. So, as well as not feeling like I could ever become more than what they're, they're telling us about us, we're gang members. Mm -hmm. I got so angry about mm -hmm. this story, got so angry about the films, and that's what for me mm -hmm. led me to say, you know what, maybe I should tell not my story but give an example of the story i was at uni arguing with lecturers all day no we're not gang members oh what happened he's got the most gangs in europe you're talking rubbish none of us are gangs do you not know what a gang is so i felt i had to get that off my chest and i think a lot of that i was holding the anger in without knowing um so even when i look at it from that perspective like i said I thought to myself, how can I do something significant? And I'm not going to say his name, but mm. for the podcast purpose, I introduced Cain. Mm. Um, and I called him Cain in the book because in the Bible, Cain and Abel are brothers. Mm. And that's my brother, is what I'm saying. That's how powerful the message is. But people miss the little subtle things you do as a writer. Mm. Call him Cain for yeah, it. Mind the my, gap and all mind that. The gap. Some people got it, some people miss it. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that I didn't want to do this book for clout and I didn't want your attention. And now, X amount of years later, we're still pushing something because it's so powerful, right. they need it to be heard. Right. But I want people to know the backdrop. So how many people do you know could sit down without Instagram liking it and people knowing, could go to a college with a guy who stabbed him in the stomach 
and do your tour? How I'd much? say not many. Not many. I'd say a few, quite honestly. A few rather than several. Yeah. How was that impact? How did that impact you, is what I'm asking, when you observed it? How could you let people know what you witnessed? I, I believe it? that, you know, first of all, you, about your tempo, okay? Mm. Because you, you, you've taught, you've put the, the nucleus yeah. right yeah. there. Um, your temper, you said to me, <laughs> don't, don't you think um, I, I, need, I need some uh, anger management? Mm -hmm. And my response was quick, and it was, what would make you want to do that? You can't manage anger. I said that to you, and I said, if you have to give up anything, yeah. do not give up anger, because that has been given to us for survival. Mm -hmm. I didn't explain about the um, reptilian brain or anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't get so technical, but I did say that to you. And then I told you that I had to promise my daddy yeah. The night before he died. On his deathbed. That I would not be the angry man. And he just told me one thing. He said, Lyndon, keep a cool head, you're better off. And he said, remember that every time you get angry. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I think at that time we sort of had something in common. Definitely. We also had that we are heart people. Mm -hmm. We are not head people, we are heart people. And the heart people are more caring and empathetic. Sensitive. And would sensitive or super sensitive. And I used to take that as an offense. Yeah. So when people call me sensitive, sensitive yeah. yeah I would take that because of the connotations mm. that, 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 you know, in values and beliefs and culture, people say, you're sensitive, you think that they're insulting you, right? But now I realize that it just yeah. means you actually make hurt more about something that someone hurt quicker hurt, but, but then and hurt more intensely you can love more intensely as well oh so exactly that's the case, oh, know, I'm, I'm, touch I'm, me I'm, I'm cool that's being fantastic sensitive, but like, it took me years to figure that out though, yeah because um, yeah. I thought my brother or people around me were sent to wear me up because yeah. I, I was always a hothead so yeah. but when I when I've fast forwarded like I said to this talk so I'll let you carry on with the talk of, with me and yeah Ken, but, and, but but Go ahead and say what you're saying. Now, yeah, I'm my temper is it was it was I learned a flexible. lot that day because for me I feel like the whole transition for, even to forget the book for a second to know that you're capable of be, of behaving a certain way. I don't want to talk too much about the book, but in jail, some of you read the book. Mm. So. In jail, when I was in jail, I had to get as violent as the people around me, and that's another reason why I didn't want to write the book because I kind of regression as they call it psychology. Mm. There's a lot of stuff I've seen and been through that is not in that book. And the writing it triggered it all up. Yeah. So I was like, but I remember you calling it, I needed to, you said that I had a term, I needed to mentally vomit. Ah, you remember and that. Very good. Very I, good. I was, that's probably another reason for the temper and, and all the emotions and all that. Because you were so, holding it in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. you, you can't hold back. Remember I said to you, you can't hold back a volcano. Yeah. And Do you remember fizzy, that? You were saying something about a fizzy drink when you shake it and it opens ah, it. Yeah. So full man, it, it explodes. Yeah. Because of the way you speak, mm. it was more visual. And that's mm. how I think I write. It's visual. So mm. a lot of what I'm saying, again, credit to Mental Farm, is not just the reason why I wrote the book, but in the style I wrote the book. So mm. I don't want to digress too much. I want to get back but you to don't it. have to digress no, because no, I can pick up, you know, like off. a relay. I'm picking up. The, no, in my the, own the, mind. I don't want yeah. to digress from what I was going to say to you about, sorry, about. Go ahead. The talk, mm -hmm. how that impacted you, the talk that I did with Kane, that's what I wanted to get back to quickly. Well, I think that with, with Kane, um, you really wanted to prove a point, yeah? To, to whomever already knew that you were a sort of rivals, mm. yeah? And you thought that the best thing is, now that you both have left the street, because he'd left the street as well, right? In my Taking on a counselling thing yeah. as far as I remember. Going to college yeah? or something, yeah. Okay. But I mean, he had started to want to better himself. Yeah. You wanted yeah. to better yes. yourself. And you somehow had a conversation and links. And then you decided, well, okay, this is a guy that stabbed me. Mm -hmm. You understand? But meaning now, it would be good if, if we're going to write a book, mm -hmm. it would be good if we both write a book. And I said, wow, yeah. that's, that's like magic. Yeah, that would really explode. And um, we used to go and pick him up mm. 
when you were doing that work with so just for the record just to make this clear sorry to cut me now mm-hmm. I just want people to hear what you just said mm-hmm. the guy that stabbed me in my stomach I wanted to write the book with him yeah I just want us to pause on that that is true because I want people to hold a meditation on it that is true do you know how powerful that would have been mm-hmm. I want everyone to hear the intention behind why I wrote Prison to the Street it mm-hmm. wasn't about it wasn't about Robin Travis so let's pause I want the whole world to hear that it was it was about the the, the rivalry had happened. Mm-hmm. We we can't do anything about that. We can't. The stabbing had happened. We can't do anything about that. But what that taught me about you is how matured your mind is, even if you didn't realize it. I did. And how you formulated this idea that would blow the minds of anybody else reading the book. And if you ask anybody who's re- re- written a, a review and they didn't mention that, maybe there's been latent in their minds, yeah? Because they haven't fully seen the power of you wanting to write a book with Kane. They haven't seen it because it's so unusual. In fact, it's almost unique. So don't be, you know, any other way than just see that that's the perspective from which they could see. Mm-hmm. But right now, because of things like that in this book, look what it's doing. We are here doing a podcast today. Oh, I have no regrets. Do you understand? I'm, yeah, I'm grateful and I want to add something as well. I have no regrets and I do understand. I fully understand yeah. how the universe and God works this way. That may have been my intention to go and basically sit down and write about how I see from two perspectives but I also wanted to show because my biggest frustration was being a youth worker at the time remember I was studying youth justice criminology mm-hmm. so even while we was having our journey mm-hmm. Robin Travis was still a youth worker people don't know these things mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. what people need to understand is I've been doing talks for years mm-hmm. 2008 I was doing mm-hmm. workshops mm-hmm. I was working with an organisation called Reality Around Gangs and I always argued with the manager, I don't like the name of this organization. Because the reality is, we're not gangs. Well, you've so always said that. You said that, that from was, day one. That was one of my frustrations. Yeah. And that frustration led on to, how can I say, it was more about not the uni saying youth justice criminology, that there's no justice in judging youth as criminals. Mm-hmm. So my frustration was, OK, having Cain there mm-hmm. to tell the story with me, Yeah would show the whole world, guess what? We're not gang members. Mm -hmm. Because I know for a fact his story was that he was broke growing up Mm -hmm. because I grew up with him. Mm -hmm. Then he started selling drugs and he became prison to the street via that entry. Mm -hmm. My entry is, I ain't gonna be no punk. I don't care how hench you are, I don't care how much guys you're with, Mm -hmm. and and this is what I do. I don't sell drugs, but Mm -hmm. I don't get victimized. And Everyone has their reason for why they become a prison to the street. You just have to be honest enough yeah, to just dig say, it out. Just say. And when I realised that people telling stories in films and that weren't being honest, mm-hmm. so I said, if I be honest and then get Kane to be honest, mm-hmm. the impact will be crazy. But you did, you did because so, I mean, you did the work in Connell, um, yeah, which Tottenham is Tottenham College. Tottenham yeah. College. It's Connell now, and oh, yeah, you Connell. did it with him. You know, I, you invited me, I, I witnessed it, I saw the role play, I saw everything and how excited the children were, right? Because of your command of the way you, you, you really graphically bring to them, you know, what the streets is all about. And they knew that if you like, you, you were seasoned to the street, yeah? You were street seasoned to the street. So, that was a real good thought. And I said to myself, I didn't tell you, I said, this is the sign of a genius. Mm. How else would somebody else be? And it also told me about your high creativity um, expectancy uh, of yourself and how that part of you was not necessarily being utilized Mm -hmm. to the benefit of yourself or anybody else. And so I told you, you and you asked me why, and I said, you know I don't answer the question why Robin is better to us, what purpose? Mm. And you said to me, but isn't it the same thing? And I said, no. You see, your purpose and your mission has already been assigned you on the day you were conceived. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And so nobody else can tell you which direction to go. This is what you're meant to do. 
this is what you are doing. Mm -hmm. And it's just because of the way you think. You're inclusive. You're not just objective-led, you're subjective-led. And that's a huge thing. Believe me. Yeah, Lynn, I just want to thank you before anything else will go on. We ain't got much longer left, but I want to say some stuff quickly about you and about where we are, here where we are now. Again, I, I think it... And I give thanks that you're still alive to have this opportunity to even have this conversation. I survived still... 2017. <laughs> you know what I'm saying Just so to be like, here today. I know things that have happened with you. <laughs> Why? So I'm grateful that yeah. we're able to have this because a lot of what Robin's doing now when I'm going to talk in third person is down to the fact that he was in uni trying to understand what youth justice and criminology was and trying to be at the difference. And that's why I wrote, but everyone was about trying to be the difference, trying to fix something in my community, in my state, that I knew was easily to fix. Easy because to fix. Because you care, Robin. And I knew it was capable. Yeah. Easy to fix because the life I've lived, and this is cliche, people say, well, if I've lived a certain life and I've changed and I can see or I'm awake now, so can you see that? But I always feel like, well, maybe they couldn't see it. In that, in that beginning of my journey, I felt like, well, maybe they can't see what they're trapped in. I've just found what I'm trapped in. This is a light bulb moment. Let me share that with everybody so then they can bust out the chains and be free. That's why on Freedom From The Street, you've got the key. Yeah. But then I realised something. A lot of people don't mind being trapped because there's a comfort and an identity in being seen as street. A social, a that, social side of things. Mm. The, 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 the gathering is either they have something in common, mm -hmm. i.e. missing daddy, missing mommy, whatever, mm. but also it is a social interaction. Definitely. And so this is the only thing that's left for them to do because there is no alternatives mm. being provided by local governments. Yeah, again, it's simple as that. Again, I'm with you because collectively people don't want to support it, not because my story wasn't a real one, but in supporting what he's saying, I kind of have to take shots at where I am now. And they're not willing to accept that they're still part of prison for the streets. But, but, let me, but let me push something to you. Yeah. You came with me to Northumberland Park Astro when the boys were having, you know, match. a football match to raise money for their friend who died. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah? You were there chair. with me Tottenham the whole chair. time. Yeah, I remember that. Right. And I remember sitting down with you on the side before I refereed the match. And, and, and you said to me, you know, Lynn, look at it. It's Broadwater Farm there, you mm. know, it's Northumberland Park there. And everybody's together mm. for one brethren who mm. is coming to mm. both sides. Why can't they do this all the time? And I remember you had another friend there. I won't say his name. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Tiverton, that's yeah, all I'll yeah. say. And um, he, you said, you know, Lynn, I feel I can bring them together, you know. Mm. And he started to choice off and say, well, ah, you can't bring them together, man, kill man, brother, and what have you, and family. You know, so they were going to do that. But you see, Robin, you are doing it now. Yeah. You are doing it now. You're bringing everybody together, because even the people who didn't, was on the other side of you, are actually for you and with you. Yeah. Yes? But here's the last bit I've got to say. Mm. You did ask the question, what made me want you to write a book? Mm -hmm. And I remember you saying that you really wanted to write a book. Remember we used to run around in the car and I had a little record tape, yeah? And at every end of our journey, I would ask you a couple of questions mm. and you would get a little bit annoyed and say, but Linda, I ain't got nothing to do with, with, with the book. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, never mind, it's okay, Robin. Um, I'm a coach, I will ask these questions. Yeah. But what you didn't really know is that I was sowing yet another seed. Yeah. I was sowing yet another seed and another seed and another seed. And when you said, well, I think I'll do it and I start small and, and go big, I said to you, Robin, 10% of one million pounds is better than 10,000 pounds. Yeah? And I said, here's one more reason that you need to consider. This could be your therapy. You remember those words? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all I got. I'm going to gonna, say. I'm gonna run it up now because <laughs> it's time to run it up. I didn't feel like it was therapeutic. I felt like I was put through hell. 
and I didn't understand therapy was painful. So, again, there was no reason to write the book. But I want to say something, because I don't think people to think this book was written in vain. I'm so thankful to the Most High that we, we, we did this in terms of write the book. The amount of lives prison to the street has affected has been amazing um, and potentially going to go on to affect to get the system to see that we're not dealing with criminals. It will influence the entire planet. I know this is going to go all over the planet mm. in different languages because most every place has a problem. Mm. They ignore the youths and the talent of the youths and in the end, revolution happens. Revolution doesn't mean violence, it just means change. It's as simple as that. And that's what you're doing, you're helping to change yes, people's well. mindsets. Thank you, Lynn. You're more um, than welcome, Robin, every time. I really don't know what to say past that. I feel like we, <laughs> we might have missed some bits, but for me, when I say missed it, it I don't feel missed it, so... We mentioned the most important the bits, main, given main, the constraint yeah, of what, time. What it is, you so know? I just want people to... If you to want know. to, you can do a part two, a part Definitely. five. You know what, you know what, you know what, exactly <laughs> that. So before we round up, I'm going to ask you any words from yourself. I'm just going to say one more thing. It's like, this is just the introduction to the podcast, people. Um... And I want people to know that what's going to happen off the back of this now is that we start having the conversations. Um, Lyndon is the reason why Prison to the Street got written because my argument is that there's no such thing as youth crime. My argument is that there's yeah. no such thing as gangs. Yeah, and I, and my thing is I'm, Love that I am you. not doing what none of these youth workers are doing when they say they're fighting knife crime. Anyone who's fighting knife crime, please don't say we're doing the same work. So even, again, to the podcast, anyone who's doing youth field work and who feels that we're doing the same thing or they're doing something constructive, come on the show. I want to have healthy conversation to say, to show you why it's not working, to show you that you can't work with the system, well, more or less you can't work with police to fix me. I'm saying that this is an internal problem. And if we change the mindset within our community, you don't need to even be policing the streets. How about that? Yeah. So what I'm saying is, to round it up, that's why Lyndon is responsible for my sowing the seed inside me so strong, I'm putting enough water on it for me to come up with this concept that there's no such thing as youth crime. There's no such thing. He's never taught me that. He sowed seeds in me that made me find it out. So that's why Lyndon's here, and we may be bringing him on in the last episode to capture anything we didn't capture this time. So Can I say me, one I'm more done. thing? I'm just done. one I just more thing. To know. It's ten seconds. I just wanted to know, is there any last words from Lyndon? That's all I was going to say. <laughs> yes, of course, you can have more than ten All seconds. I want to say is, I just want you to remember that I've heard you repeat yeah. many of my um, philosophies. Yeah. And the one Learn I behavior. really remember, Learn right? Behavior. Learn behavior. Mental Every vomiting. behavior is learned. Yeah. So let's not pick one. And the last one, last thing I've got to say is, remember this. Two things. I am not responsible for what, people for think, what other people may say, think, say, or do. Or do. But I am responsible. responsible for what I, I might choose to think, say, or do. I remember you repeating this to somebody else. And there's the other one. I do not own my behavior, mm. but I am responsible. So again, You've shown a lot of responsibility, Robin Travis. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Again. Thank you for, for the, those philosophies which enabled me to make prison to the street. Guys, mental farmer, Lyndon Waters, you'll hear from him again. Um, can you just give your website quickly as well? Um, yeah, www.lindenwalters.com. That's the um, coaching website. And this is Lyndon's book, The Taste of Champagne Urge. Massive book. Um, and it kind of feels crazy to know that this guy made me write a book, but then he wrote a book afterwards. So I feel like <laughs> he was always meant to be the author. So big up, big up, Lyndon. And, and, and yeah, much love. Let's, let's go. Prison to the Street, part one. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you very much. Love you, Sam. Yeah.